you know, new day, new verse. We continue on in Isaiah. Today we're going to be kicking up with chapter 56, verses 9 through 12. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you that you go before us, behind us, around us. Thank you that as we seek your face, we know to hear your voice and can respond to it. For the sheep are known but called by name. Lord, let us hear only your voice. Let us dwell only with you that our lives might actually look like yours. Welcoming the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, the broken, the lost, the hurting, the needing. Actually saying, come as you are to worship and believing it. Lord, help us live in a way that invites the lost, the hurting, and the broken. As you invited us when we were lost, hurting, and broken. Lord, lead the way. Holy Spirit, come, Jesus, we praise. Amen. Come, wild animals of the field. Come, wild animals of the forest, come and devour my people. For the leaders of my people, Yahweh, his watchmen, his shepherds, are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that give no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around sleeping and dreaming. Like greedy dogs, they're never satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds, all following their own path and intent on personal gain. Come, they say, let's get some wine and have a party. Let's all get drunk, and then tomorrow we'll do it again and have an even bigger party. I wanted to pause there, and I invite you to dig in. I mean, we're going to pause and keep going through this area as we read through yesterday. I want to pause here because of these words. You know, I, I've been in that place of like, oh, God is love, but see, here's a proof of the Old Testament that he's angry and burr and roar and not quite. The, the reason I want to take a pause here is because these words, although remarkably heavy, I mean, let's face it, come devour, come wild animals of the forest, of the field, come and eat the people. But look at the context. Look at when this was written. This was written during the time of the kings of Judah, right before the Assyrian sack, depending on how you want to see it, it was either a hundred years later from being brought there or, or in a vision, which... I kind of firmly believe, because kind of how God rolls, four tenths and foreknowledge he can give out to whomever he wants, and there is a difference between the two. Especially since most of what Isaiah was doing was calling out exactly what would happen in Torah. Like, follow me here for a minute, and I know it's a little woo, but I've had these thoughts in my mind for a while, so I'm just trying to slow myself down. As I look at these words, and I think about a story in Second Kings, Right? Which about similar time frame. And, uh, at least as far as when Isaiah started writing. In this particular story in Second Kings, about chapter 8, the king is walking on the wall. Uh, possibly seven. But basically, the king's walking on the wall. And he is told by a woman, maybe chapter seven, anyway, that ballpark, told by a woman, it, well, king, help, help, help. The king's like, what am I supposed to do? God's not going to do anything. What can I do? Go to the granary, go to the mill whatever. Tell me your problem. And the woman says, well, we, me and this other woman, we were starving. And last night we said, come and we'll cook my son. And we cook him and ate him. And now today she's hidden hers away. So we're going to start. And the king rips his clothes and it shows there's burlap under his skin. And it's sorrowful because they're reduced to eating their own young. And it's horrifying. It's evil. It's the repetitious nature of man. Because even if we don't devour our young physically, we will do it spiritually. And we'll do it emotionally. And we'll demand that they become little clones, the having to live vicarious three through your kids. We've been eating our young for centuries. We just don't really call a spade a spade anymore. And the sorrowful part here is that, that it would happen is kind of said in Deuteronomy. Like, if you follow me, you guys will be taken care of all the crops all the water, land of milk and honey, you're golden. Not going to remove you from it. You ignore me. You go off with every other sign of faux god, every Tom, Dick, and Harry of a god to come down the pike, to borrow from the message version, to focus on anything or anyone except the creator source who said, that guy, that family, Avram, yeah, that, that nobody. I'm going to pick him. And then of his kids, I'm going to pick that one. I'm going to pick the child of promise. And his kids, I'm going to pick this one, the heel grabber. To demonstrate that it has nothing to do with us. In case the story of Avraham, the Avram called Avraham, didn't drive it home. Let's face it, it doesn't. 
you know, I've been going through this stuff constantly. It was only today that I realized that well, Psalm 73, I think it is, has a beautiful allusion to Cain and the brutish beast of humanity that we are being lifted up when we realize where the focus lies. Not looking at envy and sorrow at the people who have it all, but recognizing that's all they're going to get. There's a reason it's hard for a rich man, harder for a rich person to get into heaven than it is to drive a camel through the eye of a needle. And this isn't, oh, it's this again, I'm trying to, no, this is an actual metaphor of little bitty needle hole, camel. And why? It's easy. How can you learn dependence on the invisible God when everything you've depended on is a liquid asset in front of you? How can you understand the certainty of God without opportunities to understand what it is to go through uncertainty and still be certain? It's, it's not blind faith. It's trust. It's reasoned understanding because we have a brain and a gift for a reason. You know, why could Abraham at that time go up with Isaac and the binding there? Because the man had spent over a hundred years at that point having his ass bailed out every time he turned around. Scring of Bilek, scring the king of Egypt, Hagar, that whole situation. Not to mention all of the other kids that came afterward. Brother understood that, okay, Apparently, resurrection is possible on this one. Uh, apparently, the impossible is made possible if he says so. Took him a while to see it. Took him forcing it with Ishmael before learning it with Isaac. But that's not a wagged finger. That's an understanding. This is the father of our faith. Much like the rock on which he built his church, Peter, it's not a perfect person. It's a person willing to be perfected when they realize how dead they are. When we realize how dead we are. It's the people here that are being devoured by the animals of the field and devoured by the animals of the forest have been devouring each other for years before this. Cutting each other down, enslaving each other. I mean, hey, go read through it right there in Jeremiah, right? Which is more close to the time that we're actually seeing these fulfilled. Hey. Right there. Jeremiah, hey, you guys, you have to release all of your fellow Israelites. Nobody gets to be a slaving. To say nothing of the fact that, again, back in Deuteronomy, seven years, they go free. The Jubilee, everybody does. And everything's returned and restored. And they say, okay, yep, we'll free them all. We'll free our slaves. We'll actually do what God says. And may God do his worst to us if he doesn't, or if we don't. And within short time at all, it went back to enslaving the people they had just set free. He keeps his word. We as a nation say we're going to actually live by his tenants and look after the least of these, and then we refuse to? Justice must be done. Justice and mercy are two sides of the same coin. If you will not have mercy, you will have justice. And if you, you don't want justice, you have to have mercy. Royal you, all of us. That's kind of the math. The unforgiving debtor, because we all have read in the ledger. It's not an opportunity to wag the finger and go, look at me, I'm superior. If we do that, we read the Bible wrong. These are opportunities to look and see, oh, wow, I've had Deva with, David with Bathsheba moments. Dang, yeah, no, Noah getting hammered and that whole thing. Yeah, been there. I've whoopsed, too. Abraham and his mistakes, Hezekiah and his. There aren't places to look at ourselves as superior. There are places to see how God is genuinely generous and gentle. To the broken, the lost, the weary, the hurting, the dead. He doesn't snuff out a candle. He doesn't snap a reed. Now come come and for those chains. Our issue is, is to borrow from a video game that I used to play borderline religiously. We're not our scars. When we think we are our scars then of course having them removed is going to be terrifying. Of course the idea of being healed is harrowing when you spent your entire life thinking that as Atlas you have to carry that stone. News slash is somebody who's been there and done that. Stone eight years to carry and your name ain't Atlas. There may be people who rely on you, but that doesn't mean you carry them. 
It means you lift them up as God carries you. We are not the source. Never have been, never could be. And to borrow from Ephesians, it has to be all his making and saving. Because if we had anything to do with it, we think we'd had everything to do with it. And proceed to go around self-righteously going, Oh, I'm the better Christian because I managed to do all of this. Cool, Pharisee. Nice, Sadducee. But that's not the law we follow. I commend you for tithing on mint. But if we do not love, are we not but the clanging of an empty gong? If we do everything there is to know, do everything there is to do, and manage to shape it all, wonderful God works the world round, but do not love, then we are nothing, because we have nothing. No wonder Jesus says, go away, I never knew you. So the point isn't the projects we do, it's about recognizing we're the project he's working on, and that each day we get to be more refined than we were the last. That's the cyclical nature that's horrifying to deal with. The leaders of the people, and you can see it this day. I'm not going to name names ever, well, unless I'm called to, because it just feels... Ugh. I want to put that caveat, because there's only one absolute, and it's him. <laughs> Death is but a stage, and taxes are kind of silly. Still, render under Caesar. The sad cycle of man is that the Lord's watchmen, they end up bloated. They end up ignorant, blind, not caring about the warning, not caring about the heads up of saying, hey, yeah, no, you can't leave the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant out forever and not expect to get it on the nose. If the chosen people didn't get away with that crap, there's no way in hell any other nation's going to. That's just logic, reason, and deduction. Again, we have a brain for a reason. It's a gift. It's part of our muchness. So it's not about, you know, doing a Colette style of constantly reading and researching and going in. It's just saying, hey, God, speak with me. I'm just too with. There is a difference. And if you've ever interacted with a human being, you know what I'm talking about. There's a difference between somebody talking to you, somebody talking at you, and somebody talking with you. My heart is to get to do the last because... We're all struggling here. The, even this isn't a basic instructions before leaving Earth. Hell, that misses the whole point of the story when it's new creation. It's not us going there, Halo's harp and lovely little twing. It, it's actual, hey, this place fixed. The story of the city. The entire time we see it, it's a place of horrifying things. Last time we see it in the Bible, it's been refined. That's the whole point. Make all things new. So the day seven could be fulfilled. The epilogue and the prologue, one beautiful conclusion of what humanity was always supposed to be. Something that we end up falling away from and falling astray to every time the leaders fall away. That's why leaders have to be so on their toes about it. Why was the king in such deep? Because he represented all the people. When he refused to do, why should the people? They don't have an example. The leader's just doing whatever comes to their fancy, pulling a judge's maneuver. In Israel, in those days, Israel had no king and did what was ever right in their own eyes. As long as that epitaph could be signed to us of doing what is ever right in our own eyes, we miss entirely. That's, again, taking from the bloody tree that got us kicked out of the garden in the first place. A tree that says, my will be done, not the Lord's. End of the day, those are the only two options. It's either the people who say to the Lord, your will be done, or the people the Lord says to them, your will be done. You don't want me? Okay. You don't have me. But here's the thing. If an inanimate thing is taken away from its source of animation, does it not simply revert to being a still object? If there's no breath in the body, no breath in the lungs, is it a person or a corpse? We don't have a nefesh, we are a nefesh. And a deaf nefesh is a sad thing. Especially when it's one walking around talking. We talked about it before on this channel. You can be very much alive and dead as a post, or on and dead as a post. And you can be off and as live as they come. 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, alive as they get. Question is, are we dead? Are we just shambling around, breathing in wickedness and exhaling chaos and destruction? Are we reeling in our dead selves and acting like these lost people? Following our own path, intent only in personal gain, seeking only the next great reprieve. Yeah, the weekend's coming. Monday is coming right after. We went through that with the Esau Edom, remember? The point isn't the weekend. The point is the one who brings the day. If we're lost in our focus of, hey, let's have an even better tomorrow, or an even better party tomorrow, not focusing on what actually needs to be done. And this isn't saying, oh, get rid of fun in any way, shape, or form. Remember, the whole thing is a wedding feast. The point is that everyone gets invited to the wedding. You know? Go out. Bring the people who are invited. Well, they told me off. He's got a cow, he's got a field, and he's got a wife. So none of them want to come. Excuse me? All right, fine. Go out. Find the outsiders. Find the people who weren't invited. Gentiles coming along? Well, everybody's invited. There's still more room. Cool. Now invite everybody else. The poor, the destitute, the ones who have no food, no shelter, no clothes. The ones who can't pay it back. Invite them, clothe them, and place them first. Because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There's a reason the parable of Lazarus and the rich man is so heavily known and why so many scholars think it was an actual story, not just a parable. Personally, I'm not sure on which one I fully believe it is. But I know if it's reality, then it fits a lot more with the idea of simply being unmade out of point. We are blessed to be a blessing. Whatever our muchness is, we are intended to use it for others. Sorry, checking the time. I try to record these in a way that people can watch them on their breaks. Because I only get 15 minutes myself for mine. The aim here is to look after others. The aim here is to rise by lifting each other. The aim here is to see the hurting. The woman with the issue of blood. The man who's desperate that his daughter has just died. The blind man. Yelling out, Hosanna. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. The deaf person reaching out and grabbing. Holding tight, not refusing to let go. The paralyzed man, brought in by his friends as they ripped open the roof and lowered him in. Because it was better to see a hurting person stand, someone they loved than it was to worry about a thing that could be replaced. That's what we do. So we have shepherds that are so obsessed with legalism and getting it right that they miss what righteousness actually is. It's right relationship. And it starts by understanding that mercy and grace are what started it all. Mercy begets mercy, grace begets grace. And if we will not do it, have we understood it at all? These are the questions I've had to wrestle with most of my life because they're heavy ones. And in a grand bout of irony that makes me laugh every time I think about it, when I was in shape that I could do all of these things, I was dead. Now that physically I'm closer to a shambling corpse than a human, my heart actually wants to. And I find that funny. Because it wasn't until I realized that I was dead by being broken on the outside that I realized how broken I was on the inside. I spent my life with false mass, hypocritical behaviors and so many lies. I got tired, I got old, like butter scraped over too much bread. There was nothing left. Nothing but anger and nothing but hurt, nothing but scars. A ruined person desperately wondering if there was even a bloody point. And in being physically broken, I realized that I could be made well. That's why I do these. I want people to get the lesson without the agony. 
to share in the understanding that when we love others as we are loved by the one who dies in our place, the whole world begins to change. And we truly are the change we want to see in the world. And we get to see all things made new. Starting with us. Starting in here as he scours the inside of the pot. Making the rest of us sparkle. As he makes us clean. That's the invitation. To let the old self die that the new one might walk forth. Put the old self to death and walk forth to borrow from Ephesians. These are the words. These are the beautiful invitation. Stop sleeping and lying around in random dreams and, oh, I had this wonderful prophecy of this and God's going to make you rich if you give me all your money. We pave roads with gold. You're missing the point. The streets are paved with gold in Revelation. What do you use for pavement of roads? Is it something valuable or something common? So common that you could make roads of it everywhere you go. It's not loot, it's people. And that's what was leading Israel astray. Whether in Isaiah's day, Jesus' day, or any of them in between, even to our own. The same game, the same repetitious cycle, the same blind leading the blind, because position, power, prestige, title, and being the center of attention means more than the people under the care. It has to change. As if it doesn't, well, I don't have to be a prophet to see a historical trend. I'd imagine it helps. But that's why we dig into his words, so that we can see what he is showing us. That the Ouroboric nature of humanity and history doesn't have to be the same. And we don't have to keep playing the same silly track, but can stand forth. Dry bones come alive, spirit dwelt within. And be made new. Choice is ours. Won't always be. So we'll either have mercy, or we'll have judgment. We'll either have grace we'll get exactly what we deserve. And that is the most horrifying phrase in the universe. Most terrifying word I know of. Deserve. Because the wages of sin are death. And every one of us has dropped the ball. So are we going to keep spreading death? Or life? The choice is ours. I pray we make it a good one. I make the same good ones in my life that others might see his face and hear his voice when we talk because the only one who makes me new is the one who made me in the first place that goes for all of us so the one who makes you the one who embraces you the one who says you're mine come as you are I'll take care of the rest may his favor favor of the Lord Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, be upon you. May his favor shine upon you. May his face, may his eyes look directly upon you. May you know his peace. And may the Holy Spirit fill you every step of the way. That when next we meet again, be stronger than the day before, and all by the work of his hand. Know that you're loved more than you could ever fathom. God willing.